Queen Victoria ascended the throne of Great Britain in 1837. She reigned 64 years, and in that time the British Empire enjoyed its most glorious, its most expansive days. She saw little of her great realms and territories beyond the seas. But among her descendants have been four British rulers who have travelled those realms and territories as through the past 70 years, empire has become commonwealth. The year 1901. The Boer War had inspired a great upsurge of loyalty to the crown a belief that New Zealand should offer men and arms to the imperial cause in South Africa. The cause was hardly honourable, but it was British, and the young New Zealanders who joined it were of that generation born in the colony which fervently called Great Britain home. After ten years of depression, the country was prospering again. The national feeling of closeness to the distant mother country, held dear by most people, could be put into words by the Premier Richard Zedman. So, a few months after Queen Victoria's death, New Zealand was loyally ready to welcome the new heir to the throne, George, Duke of Cornwall and York, and his Duchess Mary. The Duke and Duchess brought some of the trappings of empire with them, a mounted guard of sepoys from the Imperial Indian Army. Splendidly, it headed the royal processions in Auckland and Wellington. beneath archways which carried messages of greeting. Crowds were large and well-mannered. They'd been given hints on suitable behavior. The government appeals to every colonist to assist in making the proceedings successful. Aged and infirm persons should be carefully protected. Spectators are cautioned against the danger of coming into contact with electric light wires. The public are earnestly requested to refrain from throwing into the streets articles which might startle the horses attached to the carriage of their royal highnesses. In Auckland, a royal train was fitted out, and on it the visitors made the major inland journey of the tour to Rotorua. It was a six and a half hour ride and it led, as so many tourist journeys have since, to the geysers and mud pools of Wakarewa The party was a large one, including Richard Seddon and most of the cabinet. The Duke and Duchess, it was said, marveled at the thermal display. This was pure relaxation, and for the time, remarkably informal. Next day, the programme called for their Royal Highnesses to drive direct to the race course, where there will be a native demonstration and welcome according to native custom. The welcome was grand, but it was perhaps not so much the Duke as heir to the throne who was being fated as the memory of his grandmother, Queen Victoria. The many gifts were equally in her honour. To the Maoris, she herself had been Great Britain and the only monarch they had known. And in 1920, 19 years after this gathering, her presence was again invoked when Edward, Prince of Wales, told the Maori people, It is Queen Victoria's great-grandson who speaks to you today. Under her wise guidance, Māori and Pākehā grew ever closer together in understanding and goodwill. I will ever keep before me the pattern of Victoria, the great queen, whose heart was with the Māori people from the day on which they swore allegiance to her rule. Her mystique long outlasted the age named after her. The Duke of Cornwall and York was crowned King George V in 1910. Years after that, in the Christmas of 1932, his voice was heard on the wireless from Buckingham Palace by people in this country wearing slippers in their living rooms. Who could have thought such a thing that stiffly formal day in Auckland in 1901? In the years between the visits of King George V and his son Edward, all the world was catapulted into a new age. The New Zealand, which sent troops to the Great War in 1914, was no longer a territorial extension of Britain, a colony, but an independent nation sharing the British monarch. As well as fighting for an empire, her men were fighting for their own country. end, 
end, when the soldiers came home, the empire was still far flung. But in one way, it was shrinking. Improved communications and new mass media were changing social attitudes everywhere. The New Zealand, which welcomed its future king, Prince Edward, was not to be quite as awed by this royal person as it had been by his parents. The 25-year-old Prince of Wales began his tour in Auckland in April 1920. He later wrote that the purpose of the visit was primarily to make himself pleasant, to mingle and to show himself. He was travelling, he said, to remind his father's subjects of the kindly benefits attached to the ties of empire. At times, the prince thought himself back in his own country, perhaps no more so than when he visited Nelson, a quiet and proudly Anglican city which in Edward's honour decorated its main street with pillars not unlike toy sentry boxes and whose citizens welcomed him politely. He found New Zealanders calm, law-abiding and industrious and heard no trace of a local accent in their speech. In short, he thought New Zealanders very British, describing them as enthusiastic but restrained. The restraint did not extend to the decorations at a state dinner. Prince Edward, without effort, it seemed to the public, presented medals and smiled and waved. He was a handsome man, endlessly and tiresomely described as the world's most eligible bachelor. But he did feel the strain as he shook hand after hand after hand, using his left after the right became too swollen. Depending on the day's arrangements, he changed clothes several times, appearing as an admiral, a field marshal, a civilian in the space of several hours something which it seems royal persons will always be expected to do. He described as inexhaustible the supply of deputations to be met and speeches to be made, and many years later wrote that while in New Zealand, he first realized how taxing the life of a prince could be. Yet he remembered New Zealanders kindly. The feeling was mutual. The prince became King Edward VIII in 1936. He reigned less than a year, abdicating for love in favour of his brother George, Duke of York. When the Duke and his Duchess, Elizabeth, made their journey to New Zealand in 1927, such a possibility could not be foreseen. Though royal family, they were far enough removed from the throne itself to encourage informality. In the 1920s, society lost a good deal of its starch. Young people affected cynicism and were romantics. To them, the Duke and Duchess of York were a perfect couple whose marriage had been a love match, not an arrangement, and who were friendly and not much interested in ceremony. There were formal functions, of course, but not quite as many as in the past and the photographers of the day could get in close on most occasions. The pictures they took were of a smiling royal couple, usually against a background of smiling and cheering New Zealanders. As his parents had done, the Duke and his Duchess drove through the capital streets to the town hall, there to make a call on the mayor. 31 years later, the Duchess, by then a widow and queen mother, would make the same drive alone. Perhaps the 20s was really a decade of innocence. It was certainly one of faith, particularly in the belief that the future was secure and the days of peace would last forever. But it was to be the Duke's task as King George VI to reign over the Commonwealth from 1936 to 1952 and see the world spend six of those years at war. Fighting in it would be many of 1927 schoolchildren. The young Duchess could put shy and tongue-tied people at their ease and was admired for it. Looking back, it seems the most important hours this couple spent in all their travels were those in conversation with ordinary people. For no king and queen would need more to have the common touch as they, talking years later to the tired and dispossessed bombed out in World War II. They met first settlers, who had come out from Britain as children in the 1840s, who had been alive when the Treaty of Waitangi was signed. The Duke was a modest man, 
who accepted kingship when it was thrust upon him by his brother's abdication because it was his duty to accept. These gifts were for his baby daughter, the present monarch, who became Queen Elizabeth II on her father's death. Of her mother, a reporter wrote, The Duchess smiled and waved her hand in a way that had something like a personal thank you for everyone in the crowd. That smile and that attractive wave quite won our hearts. The Queen Mother has been to New Zealand twice since 1927. The first of these visits was in 1958, and the attraction of the smile and the wave had lasted. Early in her visit, she presented a standard to 75 Squadron, a group formed early in the war which flew bombing missions out of England. The Air Force ceremony was very much in keeping with the Queen Mother's entire journey. For the first time, a member of the royal family was making a full tour by air. In the few days she was in New Zealand, Her Majesty flew 2,000 miles. There was a heat wave that January, and North Island temperatures were in the 90s. It was trying for guests at the Vice Regal Garden Party, and no doubt just as trying for the Queen Mother. But one of the things expected of royalty is that it should ignore the weather and acknowledge the cheer. Again, she drove to Wellington's town hall. She waved, and in the square below, 10,000 people waved back. The crowds which gathered to see the Queen Mother did so at functions mostly planned to entertain the visitor as well as the public. She was not continually called on to receive and reply to speeches of welcome. Meeting on Trentham Racecourse, the main event of the day was won by a horse called Bally High. The Queen Mother presented a cup to the owner, Sir Ernest Davis. Sir Ernest shattered several protocols by stepping to the microphone and presenting the horse to the Queen Mother. A royal concert was the tour's only full dress affair, and all the more glamorous for it. The event was reported as glittering and truly regal. This rather grand evening was quite unlike most occasions on the tour. There were 22 official engagements, but many, like this side trip to an albatross colony near Dunedin, were informal and planned to give the visitor a chance to relax. The heat wave had broken. And the people who went to Christchurch Airport to farewell the Queen Mother did so in the rain. As the young Duchess of York, she had charmed New Zealanders in 1927. When she left the country in 1958, this most gracious lady had charmed another generation. The informal pattern of solo royal tours had been set by the Duke of Edinburgh in 1956. In New Zealand, for only a week after opening the Commonwealth Games in Australia, he saw the things he wanted to see and talked to the people he wanted to meet. He was brisk and inquiring and fascinated by industrial processes. He stretched his crowded schedule, made unexpected detours, stopped to talk about the things that caught his eye. He moved easily among businessmen and engineers and mill hands, and just as easily among schoolchildren. Navy's support ship, Endeavour, went to the Antarctic that year, with Sir Edmund Hillary leading the team. The Duke went aboard the little ship, saw the tractors which Hillary was to drive to the South Pole, met some of the men who went with him. Matting was nailed down on a jetty 400 miles to the east of New Zealand. The Chatham Islanders were making ready for their first royal guest. 
the Duke had asked to see the islands, which 14 years ago were much more isolated than they are today. From there, on the royal yacht Britannia, he would sail home. Five hundred people were on the islands then, and all of them came to the public welcome. Prince Philip was curious about the Chathams. He wanted to know how the farmers made a living from the windswept hills, how the fishermen sold their catch, what plans there were for the island's future. The Chatham Islands Jockey Club had organized a race meeting. It was a huge success. There was a tradition that royalty didn't publicly express opinions. That tradition was broken by the Duke. As any man in public life, he has views on the public scene and gives them, speaking only for himself. Because it can be seen that he talks with people, that he's interested, that he's asking and listening, his opinions are valued. Prince Philip's brief tour in 1956 was made three years after his first visit with Her Majesty the Queen. This is how the arrival of New Zealand's sovereign was reported on December the 23rd, 1953. So the Queen comes to New Zealand. 12,000 miles from the motherland, she is not among strangers. She has come to her New Zealand home. Presented by the Governor General, the Prime Minister and his wife, Mrs. Sidney Holland, pay their respects. It's the first time in history that a reigning monarch has visited these shores. Saluted by a guard of honor drawn from frigates in Auckland Harbor, the Queen is acclaimed by her people. It was a whistle-stop tour. In 38 days, 53 cities and towns were visited. On January the 7th, six towns in eight hours hosted the Queen. Through the long summer holiday, the royal party crossed and recrossed the country. And all along the way, people lined the roads and railway tracks. In the North Island at Narawahia and Rotorua, the Māori people gathered. This is the film record of their first great welcome to the Queen 16 years ago. On the river Waikato, my people prepare to welcome their royal guest. With raised paddles, they greet her in the Māori royal salute. Our sentinel warns of her coming, and in Arua Park, we watch as she reaches the Marae, our appointed meeting ground. She cannot cross it until first a ceremonial challenge has been made. This is our custom. The dart must be picked up as a sign of friendship. Now the Queen is our guest.
Queen Victoria gave us the flags. Now they fly for her great, great granddaughter. Our bishop the Bishop of Aotearoa clothed the Queen in a feather cloak called a Korowai. Now she is indeed our chief. She belongs to her Maori people. Everywhere there were children. In smaller towns, they stood alongside their parents. In the cities, massed together on playing fields and parks, they raised the dust with their running and cheered themselves hoarse. They waved flags until their shoulders ached and couldn't have been more happy. On January the 12th, the Queen drove to Parliament buildings. She was to open a special session of the House and would be the first sovereign to do so. At the opening, a precedent was set. Cameras were allowed in the chamber to film the ceremony. The sovereign of the United Kingdom no longer rules an empire, but she is head of state in several nations which by choice remain monarchies. Officially, she is known to her New Zealand subjects as Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. In January 1954, at New Zealand's solemn state functions, the words had a fine and rolling sound. At other times, it was hard to relate the grandeur of the title to the very pleasant young woman who was its bearer. Hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps a million, saw the royal couple during their five-week tour. The reserve, which the Prince of Wales found in 1920, had largely gone because the monarchy and the monarch were no longer remote. The Queen's second visit was in 1963. This tour was shorter, its pace more relaxed. Soon, she'll be here again. With her will be the heir apparent, Prince Charles, following George V, Edward VIII, and George VI as the fourth future king to travel here. The flag flown by Queen Victoria over a quarter of the earth has long since been lowered. The children who cheer Queen Elizabeth are cheering not only a queen, but a monarchy which is in tune with the age.